Hello and welcome to the latest in the MuleSoft webinar series, Secrets to Building and Connecting Applications for the New Enterprise. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of webinar logistics. This webinar is being recorded and you will have access to the recording once the webinar is over. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to ask them at any time using the questions button. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you hear something you like, we encourage you to engage on Twitter using the official hashtag MuleSoftWebinar. And finally, if you have any questions about a particular use case, you can submit them to our team of integration experts at mulesoft.com slash ask. Our speakers today are Seema Kumar, Ron Wastel, and Chris Tiernan. Seema is Senior Director of Product Marketing at Salesforce, working on the platform team. Prior to that, Seema worked on product, the product management team at Salesforce, as well as Slide and VMware. She's also held positions at Bain & Company and Intel. Seema holds a computer science degree from University of Illinois, uh, of Illinois and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Ron brings over 20 years of direct sales, business development, channels, product marketing, and management experience in areas of cloud, SaaS, CRM, ERP, HCM, analytics, and integration. Prior to joining MuleSoft to lead the strategic alliance team, Ron defined and built the Cast Iron Partner ecosystem from the beginning to over 100 cloud partnerships before the acquisition by IBM in 2010. Ron holds an MBA in corporate strategy from Pepperdine University. Chris has spent close to 15 years at Salesforce, the leader in cloud computing, helping to pioneer the SaaS industry. He spent the early part of his career at Salesforce designing the first intuitive, user-centric interface for Salesforce's flagship CRM cloud offering. Chris is an accomplished technical leader at Salesforce for a variety of initiatives, including the award-winning corporate website and Force.com applications that run the business. His passion for data and business operations has led him to focus on internal operations, where he is responsible for the long-term strategy and day-to-day -day delivery of the enterprise application integration and API practice for Salesforce IT. With that, I'll turn it over to Seema. Great, thank you, Sarah. Today, we are in an app revolution. Every company is becoming a software company. If we look at a couple of quick stats, we've seen that there have been over 140 billion mobile app downloads, and over 80% of Fortune 100 companies have built mobile apps. It, it's really an astounding figure when you think about the fact that a lot of the Fortune 100 companies are actually not technology companies to start with. One of our biggest customers here at Coca-Cola Enterprises has built mobile applications to do something that they used to do on pen and paper. So they used to go into stores and um, they'd have a notepad and they would track how companies or how um, retail stores were displaying their product, what the displays looked like, which products they were carrying, and then they would mail those back to headquarters and they'd get processed over the course of a few weeks and then that retailer might receive some sort of a credit for the channel afterwards. They've built mobile applications where they can now take photos of the displays and they can answer some quick questions about which products the retailer is displaying. And with just a few taps and hitting a submit button, that retailer knows what promotions they qualify for in just a minute in that same on-site visit. And so, you know, Coca-Cola is going from being a, a beverage company to a software company. Now, we're seeing this happen everywhere, but there's one problem, and that is that most companies are actually struggling to build mobile applications. We're looking here at the results of a survey where we can see the percent of companies, almost 60% of companies said that they thought that mobile apps were absolutely critical to their success, and yet roughly only 30% of them have actually deployed mobile applications. And the reason that this is happening is because it's actually really hard to build applications, mobile apps specifically. You have to figure out what you want to build, then you have to get the hardware, the operating system, you have to do you know, your security model, your authorization, reports and dashboards. And if you think about everything I've just listed, I haven't even started to get at the business value that the mobile app would cover, right? We're just talking about the infrastructure. And that is why Salesforce has been working on something that I'm really excited to talk about today, which is Salesforce One Lightning. So a few weeks ago at Dreamforce, we introduced the next generation of the Salesforce platform, the fastest way to build mobile apps, and that is Salesforce One Lightning. Salesforce One Lightning includes a number of dra drag and drop tools to help companies build mobile applications fast. So I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but just to quickly touch on them, 
Salesforce One Lightning comes with Lightning Components, which is a set of tools or frameworks that allow you to incorporate things like a news feed, um, a temperature chart, a slider, the standard components you'd want to include in an app. Lightning App Builder, which allows you to create apps for any mobile device. And finally, Lightning Process Builder, which provides a set of drag and drop tools to build business process automation into your apps. So let's just take a look at each one of these in detail. At Dreamforce, we introduced the Lightning Framework. Lightning Framework was built by Salesforce, and it comes with a number of standard components that come right out of the box. So you can think about things like, you know, action action bar in a mobile application, or a news feed, or a navigation menu. Those are standard components that we're including in Lightning that you can just drop right in when you're building an app. And then there are custom components and app exchange components that are being built both by both our customers and our partners, and these will be available for everyone to use. And so what we're really going to see here is an explosion of different components that allow you to very quickly build mobile applications. The next part of Lightning is the Lightning App Builder. Lightning App Builder is a set of drag and drop tools that make it easy for anybody to build apps on any device. So you can go right into this palette here and you would just select the mobile device that you actually want to build your apps for. You would drag your components in from the left and then you would drag your data in from the right, and it's that easy to build mobile apps with Lightning App Builder. The next piece that I want to talk about is Lightning Process Builder. Lightning Process Builder is our newest version of workflow, and it allows companies to automate business processes in the application. It's extremely powerful and supports processes with actions and triggers. It's very easy to use because it's using a very intuitive drag and drop interface, and it's extensible. But one problem that we've been hearing about is that while we're making it easy for companies to build applications, the data that they want to incorporate into these applications is disconnected. A lot of companies that we work with still have critical business data in legacy systems like Oracle, IBM, SAP, and Microsoft. And they find it really challenging to get that critical business data into the custom apps that they're building for their employees, their customers, and their partners. And it's the reason that when we talk to CIOs, they tell us that integration is their number one challenge. We did a recent survey and we heard that 48% of CIOs said integrating data is their number one pain. It's an incredible challenge. So that's some background on Salesforce One Lightning and the big challenge that we see integration poses to CIOs. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Ron Wastel of MuleSoft, who's going to share with you their perspective on the integration challenge and how they're addressing it. Ron? Thanks, Seema. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about how to connect Salesforce One to the rest of your enterprise as we talk about this, this explosion of new opportunities around mobile applications, but how do you connect it to the rest of the environment that's out there today? Um, according to Gartner, Roughly 70% of overall mobile app projects usually are related to integration as a fundamental cost to the project. And so that, that requires connecting to enterprise application services and data sources, not just necessarily in the cloud, but on premise. And so how do you really solve that problem of building these new applications and connecting to all these legacy sources is a question. Well, there's a couple ways to do it. One way is to connect point to point to different systems that are out there. But the challenge of that is it doesn't really scale up. What you find is that if you build custom code, oftentimes it's very tightly coupled to those systems. It's difficult to change, and there's not a lot of visibility of what's happening within that code on the integrations themselves. The other approach is to pick a tool or two or three between a SaaS integration or to your SOA environment or for new APIs, and it fits narrow use cases, but it doesn't really allow you to scale up and manage the agility and the flexibility required to scale Salesforce out to your environment. So if you think about it, what Salesforce announced uh, at, at, at Dreamforce was about being the customer success platform, and that drives the ability to create new applications to the customers, the partner environments, and the employees that, out, uh, that are out there today. And if you think about that, that's allowing you to connect your mobile, your web applications, and to other systems. But the challenge is that there's a lot of data locked on the left side of this picture here associated with how do we get the data on the left 
that's in the legacy systems and other systems out there out to the users and through the mobile applications that you're building inside of Salesforce. There's one way to do that, which is you could build out and build these integrations with different tools and different types of technology, but that's maybe not the best way to scale up and build out the platform associated with that. What's required really is a platform that has that creates the agility that you have in the front end with Salesforce to the back end to create a strategic approach of how you integrate Salesforce to your back end systems. So what we believe is needed is to maximize uh, Salesforce uh, One platform ROI is to have uh, a proven enterprise connectivity platform that allows you to get to the systems of records that are back in your enterprise that are optimized for transaction processing but really not optimized for the systems of engagement that people are now building in mobile devices out there today. So with a platform that's designed to be that simple, what you find is that you can do sophisticated integration requirements, not just simple, and the ability to unify the connectivity of your SOA environment, uh, your SaaS applications, and your APIs on one platform uh, can really allow you to unlock all the capabilities in the enterprise to the Salesforce One platform. Uh, the other thing is low friction. So what's critical is that the, these integration projects should keep up with the mobile application projects that you're doing and associated today. So it needs to be quick and able to connect and integrate quickly to the other uh, systems that are out there. And then finally, what's also critical that we found is that you need a hybrid approach to this. If there are many of the applications and the gravity of many of the data sources are in the back office, it oftentimes makes sense to maybe run the integration in the back office and connect out to Salesforce. But you also have the option to move that environment to the cloud and run it in the cloud at the right time if that makes sense or decide to go cloud first. So what's also needed is a platform that allows you to be hybrid and be able to run it either place. So what the MuleSoft AnyPoint platform is, is this unified connectivity platform for Salesforce. It has the ability to not only integrate to the Salesforce platform to do data loading, to do user mashups, to do process automation and information aggregation, but also connect back into the on-prem CRM, ERP, and HCM systems that are out there. Uh, create legacy modernization capabilities to, uh, to layer web services on top of older systems and to allow uh, systems to talk out to uh, both the API environments that are being created out there with new mobile applications that are happening, private APIs that IT and line of business are creating, as well as public APIs that you may need to connect to in other uh, SaaS and cloud systems. So what we found talking to a number of Salesforce customers over the years is that they really go through a, an interesting progression of how they look at this problem. They basically start by thinking through, how do I get the data in? How do I load it into Salesforce? How do I then start to access this data from other systems inside the Salesforce user interface? So I can be aware of what's happening upstream and downstream in the systems when I'm looking through the Salesforce account record or customer opportunity. And then finally, how do I start syncing that environment with the rest of my systems that are associated with that. And that drives them also oftentimes into the next step in the process, which is how do I start automating my processes between Salesforce and my back office systems? How do I orchestrate the quote to cash process over time? And then what, what we found is that as these customers mature past these first two steps of data integration and process integration, they start to ask uh, much more deeper questions about how do I manage the change that's associated with my organization over time, with all these APIs that are showing up, not only the Salesforce platform APIs, but other APIs that are showing up from other SaaS vendors uh, and the on-premise system. And so what they're starting to ask for is, how do I manage these APIs and, and manage these shared services associated with that? So this is kind of a pattern we see happening today. And one thing we, we suggest to those that are listening today is, where do you fit on the spectrum? And where do you think the next step in your ability to maximize your ROI with Salesforce makes sense. What I'd like to do is, as we as we talk about that spectrum, I'd like to shift back to SEMA for a second and talk about Salesforce Lightning Connect. There's a lot of excitement around this. There was a recent press announcement around it. And I'd like SEMA to kind of talk about what's going on with Salesforce Lightning Connect, and then I can talk about how MuleSoft fits into that. Great. Thank you, Ron. So I, I shared with you earlier what Salesforce One Lightning is. 
Um, but I was saving this bit because this is something that we just announced. So we recently announced Salesforce One Lightning Connect, um, which is under the overall Lightning product umbrella. And Lightning Connect is the fastest and easiest way to integrate any data source with Salesforce. So you heard earlier from both Ron and I that companies are really struggling to integrate all of these disparate systems that they're managing. And so what we at Salesforce wanted to do was to make it really easy for customers to integrate a lot of these backend systems with Salesforce. So Salesforce Lightning Connect is um, a new way of integrating systems with Salesforce that is fast. It's a point and click tool where you can get integration done in just a few minutes. It enables you to do a real time integration. So you're looking up the data in the moment by reference. You're not copying or storing that data in Salesforce. So if you have huge amounts of data that you don't need to access very frequently, but you want to be able to see the freshest, most accurate data, this is a great way to do that. And finally, Salesforce One Lightning Connect is extensible, and it brings the full power of the Salesforce One platform to all your data in other systems. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you integrate data with Salesforce One Lightning Connect, you're representing that data in a Salesforce object, in something called an external object. And what that allows you to do is to treat that data as if it was native on the Salesforce platform, and you can do things like build mobile applications with it. You can put it in Saucel and Sockle queries. You can put it in Canvas and Visual Flow, and even run global search on it. So imagine taking that legacy data from SAP and Oracle and just piping it right into your Salesforce One mobile app. That's what you can do with Salesforce One Lightning Connect. Back to you, Ron. Great. So where, where does uh, MuleSoft fit into Salesforce Lightning Connect? Uh, what you find is that for Salesforce Lightning Connect to maximize what is in the legacy environment that we talked about earlier, what's needed is some kind of gateway that allows you to connect to all these systems that are back there, uh, including SAP, Oracle, and Microsoft. And so what MuleSoft designed working with Salesforce very closely is the ability to connect very quickly from the Salesforce screens into these legacy systems and be able to set up your gateways very quickly so you can start to access pretty much any business object that's associated with those legacy systems and start to view things like orders, invoices, shipments that have been made downstream um, from the Salesforce system and be able to share that to your customers immediately in real time and, and be able to be obviously uh, mobile enabled immediately so you can not only see that through your browser but be able to leverage that on the road as needed. So one of the key capabilities of AnyPoint Data Connect is it really reduces dramatically the time it takes to start leveraging back office information with Salesforce One uh, Lightning Connect. So with that, I'd like to go to the, kind of the next step, and that is, so what do they start to look like? What do these applications start to, uh, start to um, view inside of the Salesforce platform? And if you think about it, this is a good example of an employee application where I may be grabbing employee profile information from one system, uh, hours worked from another system, 401k information, uh, managers and tasks and team profiles, paychecks, etc., from multiple systems. But as far as the user knows, I'm using Salesforce and I'm seeing all that information in Salesforce. Right? To give you another example of what this might look like, is a customer example. So this could have information from e-commerce systems that are pulled into the environment, uh, geolocation data, et cetera, order history that we talked about from, let's say, SAP or Oracle, customer records, and even pay payment and credit card information. So the idea here is that from a composite view standpoint, I don't really care where these other applications live and where the data lives. I don't want to open five to ten different systems to see it. I want to actually view it in one screen and be able to act on it depending on my role and responsibility in the company. So kind of to, to, to wrap this up on the MuleSoft side, what you're thinking about here is how do I optimize the Salesforce uh, return on investment and value? And that is by driving the integration requirements up this view from data loading to querying mashups to process automation to information aggregation to a full shared services architecture. Uh, an API lifecycle, you can really maximize the return on investment you're making in Salesforce across your enterprise. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chris Tiernan to talk a little bit about how Salesforce is doing this internally and how it's working with its line of business to optimize the experience. Thank you, Ron. Um, first, I just want to give a couple quick facts uh, around Salesforce. So it started in 1999, headquartered in, in San Francisco, uh, just a little north of $4 billion in revenue. Uh, 
We just won our fourth year in a row on most innovative company. Uh, we are now eclipsing 15,000 employees within the 16 year uh, history of Salesforce. Uh, and then uh, this year at Dreamforce, 130,000 attendees with uh, 8 million uh, online viewers. And so with that growth um, at a 30% clip every year, uh, we have uh, an, an ecosystem internally at Salesforce where we have a, a hybrid of, of online uh, or cloud-based systems with on-prem systems that uh, all our departments and different business units need access to that data. Uh, so from application development teams who need to uh, build internal applications uh, with enterprise data or even mobile development teams that need to access that information and customer app facing applications as well uh, such as our help and training or uh, Dreamforce portal and so forth. Um, and then every year we always <laughs> seem to acquire a new company and so how do we plug those company, uh, companies in quickly as possible into the Salesforce ecosystem and today uh, it's not an easy task. Some of the challenges that we have with the point-to-point -point architecture that we're in right now, uh, budget constraints. Um, uh, uh, as Ron mentioned earlier in his presentation that 70% uh, of uh, mobile costs are integration related and you could probably say the same for a lot of other uh, application development. Um, anytime you have an hy a hybrid um, environment you're going to need to get access from various systems and integration always needs to be a percentage of that budget. Uh, and with this point-to-point uh, -point architecture, you also lose opportunities. It's hard to adjust to the market conditions. Uh, and so uh, you need to have an architecture, an integration architecture that allows you to have the flexibility to, to be able to, to make movements uh, when you need to uh, over the course of time. Uh, also, uh, limited capabilities around um, if you're always spending money around integrations to, uh, uh, for your applications, uh, that money could be better spent for business logic um, within the application for the end user and not on the integrations. Obviously scalability, uh, managing point to points is going to be a, a huge issue. Uh, we talked a little bit about the mergers and acquisitions, how do you plug uh, those companies into your ecosystem quickly. Uh, and then uh, opaque understanding, uh, it's really hard for uh, your end users or, or application users to really understand where the data is coming from uh, and if you have issues, where those issues are. And so it creates a lot of distrust with your customers or business partners. So we want to remove that. And obviously, um, uh, supportability is, is really uh, difficult in a point-to-point -point architecture, especially as, as a large enterprise. Uh, just to give you an example, we had a, uh, a project a couple years ago where we needed to change four fields uh, in uh, over 50 integrations, and we spent about a year and uh, close to a million dollars making those changes. So it's just, it's not a scalable architecture to, to be in. And so what does the future look like? We first uh, set out to take a look at you know, how does, how does our business prioritize initiatives uh, and, and the dollars around those initiatives? And, uh, you know, how do we expose that data for them to access um, uh, that data so that they can build their projects in a much more efficient way? And so uh, we came up with a high-level uh, data delivery strategy where APIs are really at the core of delivering that data and allowing us to self-serve or allow the business or, or our project teams to self-serve themselves to that data. And so they're not relying on a integration team to build an integration for them. They're not relying on uh, building out these integrations uh, as a point-to-point -point, uh, system for themselves. Uh, they can go to a self-service portal, uh, look up an API, and incorporate that uh, directly. And so double-clicking into that, the API layer is really where the magic happens. This is where we find that agility uh, for the business can, can really take off. And uh, where if you're building mobile apps or uh, web apps or any uh, other type of legacy type of uh, applications, you can connect to the same uh, API services uh, for your applications. So this really uh, reduces the time uh, for project teams to, to deliver their projects. Um, it increases the overall business agility. Um, we have greater control of the uh, project dollars since we don't have to re 
uh, invent the wheel and spend money on doing integrations. Uh, a lot of these APIs are all reusable uh, for the business. So when we came up with that architecture, we, we needed to find an integration uh, platform that, that uh, fit our needs. And so we came up with uh, a, a large criteria of uh, wish lists, if you will. Uh, we looked at five integration uh, players out there, uh, two on-prem, three in the cloud, and came up with a pretty extensive uh, evaluation criteria list um, that uh, would meet this architectural vision and the way our business, or how our business uh, works. Let me just highlight a couple uh, areas that we think uh, are really important for us uh, within this architecture. One is a canonical data model where we can really decouple the, uh, uh, the publisher or the source system from the target system. Um, and so having an integration platform uh, that has uh, the ability to, for us to support a canonical data model was a big, uh, a, a, a big criteria for us. And then secondly, um, with uh, an ESB architecture and a SOA-based architecture, you're going to get some business agility, but we also want to make sure that um, our, our actual delivery process of uh, integration components and APIs are also um, uh, maximized. And so uh, continuous integration and delivery and having a platform that supported that uh, was a big uh, um, criteria for, for my team uh, in general. And so when you look at ESB and SOA combined with integration, uh, continuous integration and delivery, uh, those two aspects compound um, the uh, speed to which we can get uh, APIs and integrations out the door for our customers. And so just looking at a high level uh, view of what um, our architecture is, uh, on the bottom we have uh, source and target systems. In the middle, we have our enterprise service bus where uh, we have our connectors, we um, build our source and target adapters and map them to the canonical and then ultimately expose those uh, as an API at the API management layer where we can wrap policies around the request and the response um, for our end users. There's also the data delivery. How how just exposing it as an API is, is, not, is not the uh, end all, but there's also different ways of uh, exposing and delivering that data. And uh, so we looked at three different data delivery models for the enterprise uh, based on all our use cases. We, uh, the cost of doing business is ma machine to machine or system to system type integrations. This is where you just wanna sync uh, data from one system to another system. Uh, and so we knew that we needed to have that uh, in place. Uh, the next uh, level of uh, data delivery for us is API data services where we expose those uh, APIs. Uh, in this case, we have uh, REST APIs for uh, worker information. A worker is an employee, a contractor, an intern, anybody that does work for Salesforce. And uh, teams can now leverage those APIs to build their applications, whether it's on the force.com platform, uh, the mobile platform, or web app. The next, uh, uh, so when we rolled this out, uh, we looked at uh, uh, how, all the use cases that we needed to work with. Um, we came up with a worker retrieve where you can put in an employee ID and, and get a result set back of that employee. Uh, worker query where you can put in a result, uh, I'm sorry, a query of uh, uh, custom parameters that you want to get an employee result set back. And then also worker update. How do you uh, push back those changes that you make to an employee back into the source system? So we released uh, three of those APIs uh, out to uh, the teams uh, to leverage uh, and are currently working uh, to incorporate uh, an OData service uh, as well to uh, sit side by side with these um, with these APIs. So let me just highlight a couple use cases here uh, with our uh, worker APIs. Um, the first one was with a, a case study for uh, Google Groups. Uh, we uh, recently switched over to Gmail. Uh, we use Google Groups for our 
internal uh, email distribution list. Uh, we had a use case where uh, all our executive, executives wanted uh, three uh, email distribution lists, one for their entire organization, one for their direct reports, uh, and then one for managers. Uh, and so uh, to, to manage that at Salesforce, um, it was becoming an increasing, uh, increasingly uh, large cost. Uh, a lot of the uh, tickets had to be logged, there was lag time for that. So uh, we asked the Google Groups team to uh, leverage our worker APIs uh, and be able to build a sync from that and populate the Google Groups. Uh, and that we found that uh, we were able to save about 75K a year uh, and increase customer satisfaction around um, the synchronization of employee uh, updates to those distribution lists. The uh, last use case uh, or case study I wanted to provide was the sales realignment employee data load. So every year we go through a uh, employee or uh, employee sales um, uh, territory realignment process. Uh, so we look at uh, what what um, territories sales folks are working in. Um, are they on the right accounts? Do they um, are they compensated correctly, and so forth. And so. Um, we do this, this modeling uh, every year. Uh, we make changes to 5,000 plus employees that are in the sales force and determine what changes need to happen to those employees and then push that back into our source system, which is uh, Workday. Uh, in the previous uh, years, it was about a three week endeavor across multiple teams uh, with a very high uh, error rate on the data. Um, to, to actually uh, process that information. And so we built this worker API to be able to uh, do that within 20 minutes uh, of those changes and then also reduce the error rate by 10 times. Um, and so this, is, this has had um, a, a, a great impact on the business. We're able to process that much more rapidly, much more accurately, uh, and allow folks to work on higher value uh, uh, data. So that's how we're uh, working with uh, uh, APIs and uh, integrations at Salesforce. Thank you, Chris, Ron, and Seema. Uh, before we move to q and I'd like to go over a few logistics for anyone who joined us a little bit late. This webinar is being recorded and you'll have access to the recording after the webinar is over. If you have any questions for our presenters, now is the time to send them in. You can do this by quick, uh, clicking the questions button at the top of your screen. Also, if you'd like to share something that you heard in this webinar, we encourage you to engage on Twitter using the official hashtag MuleSoftWebinar. And finally, if you have any questions about something specific or if your question is not answered in our Q&A, you can submit them to our team of integration experts at MuleSoft.com slash ask. Now we're ready to take our first question. So this one, uh, Seema and Ron, it looks like it's a good one for you. It's when should I use Lightning Connect and when not? That's a great question. So Lightning Connect is great for when companies want to have access to data that changes frequently, and it's critical for them to have the most up-to-date, accurate information. So a great example of this might be um, a retail company who processes customer returns, and you might have a company that pro a customer who sends in a product for return, and that data, that transaction data, is stored somewhere else in a legacy system. But you want to make sure that if that customer calls into your customer support line, that customer support is able to pull up that transaction, even if it happened, say, yesterday. So, you know, fast changing data is a great example. Um, another example is when companies want to be able to interact with that data and build it into mobile applications or build it into their, their Salesforce processes. Um, that's another great example. And then finally, I would say when companies don't have kind of the right integration skills in-house and they, they want to be able to create a quick, simple, seamless integration with Salesforce, that's another great time. Ron? Yeah, just to uh, add to that, um, I, I would say wh when when should you not uh, consider Lightning Connect? And I think and the answer is is that if you're looking for an operational view, real time of what's happening across the enterprise, it's a perfect fit. If you're looking to actually start to process the data and write the data into the next system, let me give you a classic example. If I'm taking an opportunity out of Salesforce and I want to put that order into SAP, 
I'm going to need to write the data and move the data along so I can process the customer downstream in the activity. In those situations, it makes sense to use the MuleSoft platform as more of a process integration, as I talked about earlier, versus a data integration where you're just viewing the data. So hopefully that gives you an idea of when to use kind of a read mechanism to view the data very quickly so everybody is aware of what's happening with the customer across the enterprise versus writing the data downstream and upstream to systems because you want to actually process activity with that customer. Okay, great. And Chris, this seems like a good question for you. It's um, how do you work with your business users? I know you addressed that a little bit, um, but it sounds like some people want to hear a little more about that. Right. So. Um, like I mentioned in the presentation, uh, we, we um, are looking to make it more self-service, but uh, so we have kind of two lines of, of ways of working with the business partner. We um, will uh, put things uh, through a, uh, an alignment process um, based on the budget and the priorities. Uh, they'll work down to the scrum teams to, to execute and deliver. Uh, but the ultimate goal is really to shift that focus and move to a self-service portal where uh, teams can uh, leverage those APIs um, uh, in a self-service fashion so that they don't have to really go through IT. Uh, it's more of a, a data platform and a, and a core service that IT provides to the enterprise uh, for their data. Great. And then, Seema, I think this is a good one for you. So what is Lightning Connect and how do partners like MuleSoft fit in? Great question. So Lightning Connect is effectively a way of doing data virtualization or data federation for anybody listening today who's familiar with those terms. Um, that's, that's really what Lightning Connect does is it, it makes a real-time call out to the data source and then returns that data um, to the business user or the end user who's trying to interact with it. Um, and really the way that Lightning Connect works with partners is that we are looking, we Salesforce Lightning Connect are looking to consume the data in an OData format. And you know, not all applications speak o OData. A few do, but most do not. And so we work with a number of partners like MuleSoft who you can use to then go out and connect to your source applications and expose that data in OData. And then you can also use the products to kind of abstract different instances behind them and really just give Salesforce one endpoint or one server URL to get data from. Ron, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I just want to, to, to emphasize uh, the point of if, if Salesforce is, is looking for that O data uh, protocol, what MuleSoft's doing on the backside is translating whatever protocol we're talking to on the other system into the O data format so Salesforce can have access and view that information easily. Great. So one more question. Ron, I think this is a good one for you. Um, the question is, I don't have a mobile app project, but I need to connect Salesforce with other systems. Do you do that? Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, uh, the key thing to note is uh, what we're really talking about today is uh, this, this idea of this customer journey with Salesforce about the different use cases and the different approaches. And where we think we're very strong as a company with Salesforce customers is the ability to handle multiple use cases. So not only how do I get the data into Salesforce, loading it into it to start building out my customer database, uh, not only Lightning Connect, how do I view that information across the different systems in real time, but three, how do I process that information across the different systems so I can actually drive the customer down a process of from marketing to sales to service to finance, et cetera. That, but then finally, how do I manage the API changes that are going on associated with that? As Chris mentioned earlier, a big part of this is what you want to get to is an environment where people are leveraging the APIs and be able to ma manage the versions across to different audiences to simplify the ability to integrate to different systems. Great. And then um, after this, we have time for one more question. But Chris, here's one for you. How did you pick which integration platform to use internally? Yeah, so that's it's that's not easy. It's always uh, difficult to, to choose a product. Um, we did uh, have to really look across holistically across the enterprise of all the different use cases that our, our business partners were, were looking for um, and, and looking how to support those. We also wanted something that was is flexible enough to be able to uh, allow us to uh, um, deliver those use cases that we, we didn't know about. Uh, and so some of the core uh, areas was connectivity. Does, does the integration platform uh, have connectivity out of the box to um, a majority or if not um, all our uh, endpoints that we need to, to work with? 
Also, productivity. How how productive can my developers be at delivering integrations and APIs for my business users? Um, and then also product vision. Where where is the integration platform going uh, in the next five to ten years? Um, is it going to be in the cloud? Um, uh, is it um, going to be uh, able to support our business uh, at the growth that we're growing? Great. And then our last question here, um, what data sources can I connect with Lightning Connect and Data Gateway? Well, the great thing about Lightning Connect is that because it uses an industry standard, you can basically connect any data source to it. Fantastic. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions. At this point, I'd like to thank our audience for joining and participating today. I'd like to thank uh, Chris, Ron, and Seema for the great presentation, and we hope you will join us next time.